a large number of VCs are reinvesting in their existing portfolio to ensure it can survive COVID and all the downturns that are happening. So you see a large number of A rounds that are at the, about the same valuation. So they're basically re-upping to ensure they can survive. What mm -hmm. that means though, is if you haven't raised funds already from an existing VC, it is extremely difficult. I have met numerous people in, that, in the space, brilliant, with, uh, allow me to say, and capacity to commercialize their ideas. Uh, so it's uh, up to us as uh, investors to become trustful partners, build a relationship, and really forge, uh, you know, a partnership that will uh, nurture growth. But overall, I expect actually a shift to increasing spending over the next few years, just because the money is there. The funds have funding, um, yeah. and, the, and that's gonna generate the investments. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, uh, so we have uh, an amazing event on energy trends uh, and uh, industry trends in the energy sector. The first part of the event is the panel discussion and the second part of the event is the pitching session. So the first part uh, will last for one hour and um, uh, first, I will introduce myself and then the discussion will start. So, uh, let me share the screen. So, uh, a global business development. Development company will help to match uh, uh, leading investors and help potential startups. And our special focus is on cross-border deals. I mean, where investors in the U.S. startup is in Europe, or startup is in U.S. investors in Europe, or whatever. We, we like such uh, cases, and we like to have a good network and to bring people together. Uh, I personally started in Columbia, in London, business school on the both sides of the ocean. So I, I love to, uh, to be connecting the world, I would say. And that's why we have investors from Europe and from the US to exchange uh, and share their views. Uh, we also do this event with the support of Gold Ventures Investments. It's our partner. They help us with select selections of startups. I will talk about it a bit later. So how do we help startups? Uh, we do warm introductions for them to VCs. We help them to do the strategy, the business development strategy, I would say investment, rather investment relations strategy, like which funds are most suitable for them and how to approach them, how to start communication, how to sell yourself and things like that. Also, I have about 10 years of experience in private equity. I closed the deals for the total amount of more than $500 million. So I also will help startups to um, uh, structure the deal and uh, to, I would say, negotiate your term sheet. And despite you need to have a local lawyer, uh, still uh, the, the principles are the same. So uh, we can uh, help with uh, term sheet negotiations. Our partner Gold Ventures Investment, they help us also to get grants from Europe, uh, from European public institutions uh, to help investors to make their investments more profitable. And they also help startups to find new clients and to gain new markets. Uh, so uh, here are our investor investors panel and here I give the word to Chris who kindly um, ah sorry this is not the one <laughs> I'm sorry uh, so uh, we have uh, ah this is the one just one moment I, I need to share the other one So uh, Chris kindly um, agreed to help me with this session. So Chris, uh, could you please introduce yourself and uh, start the panel and let investors introduce themselves as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, hello everybody. Um, and thank you, Elena. Uh, so uh, we've got a fantastic panel here today. And so for the next sort of uh, 55 minutes or so, 
Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, what's going on in terms of energy uh, and the current trends that are happening. Uh, I'm Chris Gentle. Uh, I uh, used to be a partner at Deloitte. I'm now a senior advisor to the World uh, Energy Council. If you haven't heard of the World Energy Council, we have membership uh, in 100 countries around the world and uh, really around the preeminent organization around energy transition. And I think one of the things that's happened with COVID that we've seen is that uh, we've, uh, we've actually done some work and research on this, which shows that we've seen perhaps the biggest shift in history in terms of capital allocation in the last three months in energy. Uh, so we've run a survey of 61 countries uh, of energy organizations in those countries. Uh, and we can see a shift in capex of something between 200 and 400 billion. Uh, and uh, obviously that's been particularly in the oil majors, but all, all across the different energy sectors that's happened. But probably most important for today is actually that when we uh, look at actually how uh, energy companies are actually reallocating investments, they prioritize uh, three things, innovation, R&D, and digitization. Now, uh, what we've seen in energy in the past is basically the big companies have basically been driven everything. Uh, well, what we're seeing now is actually there's a real pivot now to smaller companies around innovation and venture capital. So we've got a fantastic group today to really kind of explore what that may, might mean in practice about which sectors energy is gonna to go to, how can this drive energy transformation, uh, and so I'm looking forward to a great discussion with everybody today. So uh, what I'd like to do is just like, uh, let uh, each uh, member of the panel just kind of introduce themselves briefly and then we'll go to our kind of first question. So uh, Harik, if you would like to just kind of do just a kind of a quick kind of 20 second introduction of you and then we'll kind of go on uh, for each member of the panel. Harik. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm working at Rockstart, uh, which is uh, uh, accelerator and fund uh, investing in early stage uh, startups. Um, one of the main themes that we operate in, but not the only one, is energy. Uh, and we focus on the digital enabling technologies in this industry. Uh, we've invested in 45 startups over the last five years, and we've uh, established almost a new venture fund, which will uh, again invest in up to 50, 50 startups in the next four to five years and actually um, uh, assist them through growth, uh, making use of our ecosystem of uh, experts, industries and investors. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'll just go with what's on the screen. So Constantinos, could you uh, just kind of do a quick introduction for 20, 30 seconds, please? Yes, hello, and thank you very much for the invitation to be a participant in this panel. Uh, I'm working for Brook Street Equity Partners. We are a London-based growth capital fund investing in asymmetric markets with special emphasis in Southern Eastern Europe and especially Greece. We are focusing on companies in the tech, industry 4.0 and in energy sectors and uh, have made three investments so far in the, in the country. And uh, one of the companies that we have invested, Nanofos, is particularly engaged in the photovoltaic sectors and I'm looking forward to speak more about it in the future. Looking forward to a fruitful discussion. Great, thank you. Uh, Fernando? Do we have Fernando? Ernst? Yes, I'm here, was not here. You are, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. So, uh, thanks a lot for the invitation, great to be here today. So uh, my name is Fernando Sandoval. I am responsible for of the Enel Innovation Hub Europe, as we call it. Uh, Enel Innovation Hub Europe is the branch of Enel for doing the developing of the uh, relationship with the European ecosystems and uh, the scouting of the best European startups able to work with Enel. Enel is a multinational Italian utility uh, we are one of the largest in Europe and we are leading the energy transition globally. Uh, we do not invest in startups and this is something I want to make clear from now and Elena already knew it. So um, our approach is completely different. It's what is called a co corporate venture client. What we want to develop is win-win relationships with the startups. We want them at the end to become uh, suppliers of the group by working with us. Great, thank you. Uh, Ernst? Hi, my name is Ernst Sack, a partner with Blue Bear Capital. We're a venture capital firm here in the US on the West Coast and in Houston. 
focused on digital technologies across the energy infrastructure and climate industries. And we really focus on the earliest revenue stages, typically late seed or series A, and try to accelerate growth through our strong network of private equity firms and energy operators that want to use digital technologies in their assets. Yeah, delighted you could join us. Um, Mark from Centrica. Hi everyone. Hi. Yeah, uh, this is uh, Mark Savas. I work for uh, Centrica Ventures, uh, which is a corporate venture capital arm of, of Centrica. Some of you might know it as British Gas, uh, and in the US it's called Direct Energy. So uh, uh, let's say a US UK um, a power su um, a power supplier. And Centrica Ventures focuses on investments, minority investments in energy-related companies. Uh, usually we invest in more or less Series A, uh, sometimes in Series B. Uh, we've been running for about uh, almost three years now. We've made 12 investments um, across US, uh, Europe, and, and Israel, where we, have, where we have teammates. And our main areas of investment is home energy management, uh, e-mobility, um, and uh, and uh, a little bit of Industry 4.0. Great, thank you very much. Matthias? Matthias? Yeah, hello. Uh, well, I'm not from the panel, I'm a startup. So, okay. perhaps uh, uh, later. Chris, uh, Matthias, thank you. Chris, you may want to follow the... Uh, the... Yeah. Sorry, so I, Alex? Hello. My name is Alexander Starchenk. I'm a managing partner of Fast Energy Ventures, a London-based uh, venture capital company. Uh, we are focused on energy transition technologies uh, in, in wide meaning, uh, energy uh, new mobility, uh, energy storage, uh, microgrid management, uh, upgrade of existing uh, solar and wind installations, etc. Our stage, uh, it's a series uh, series A and series B. Uh, it's uh, first sales of the startups. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Temple? So I am a managing director of Clean Energy Ventures. We are a Boston and Cambridge-based venture fund, early stage venture fund. Um, we invest in uh, all tech any technology that can reduce at least two and a half gigatons of greenhouse gases between now and 2050. Um, so a very specific mandate, but makes us agnostic to the types of investments we make. So we invest in advanced materials, electronics, hardware, uh, software, in innovative business models. Um, we, uh, we've been investing, we've formed in 2008. Uh, we initially formed as a private investor syndicate uh, where we were investing our own capital and then we ended up raising a fund in 2017. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, last but not least, Thomas. Hey, folks. So my name is Thomas Kemdis. I'm a partner at Contrarian Ventures. Uh, we are an early stage energy tech and e-mobility focused VC fund. We invest all over Europe and Israel. Uh, we currently have 15 portfolio companies that are actively investing, done a few deals during the COVID-19 crisis, and which is continuing. So and actively looking for for new deals. So glad to be here on the panel and. I know some of the folks, Alex Starchenko, we co-investor in a few companies with First Imagine, so gl glad to see you here. Great. Thank you very much indeed. So uh, I, I, I opened up by talking about basically the, 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 the pivotal shift that we've had, maybe the, the most historical shift in terms of reallocation of capital. The purpose of what we want to do here is really look about what that means in real kind of in terms of investment trends. Uh, and I just wondered if I could maybe open up with the first question and actually kind of saying, uh, how are you seeing this happen on the ground? And I don't know whether or not uh, we've got anybody who would like to answer that first in terms of actually seeing that pivotal shift and where capital is going. Maybe, maybe Fernando, you could talk from basically being in a big energy company in terms of NL, as uh, your CEO has talked about some of these big shifts and about what you're doing as a group. Could you just talk very briefly about that in terms of your kind of uh, view about this kind of uh, pivotal shift in capital and its reallocation? in order to address uh, you know, energy transition and climate change. I don't know if I'm the right uh, person to talk about uh, pivotal change in capital's uh, allocation for startups in the sense of that we do not invest in the startups. But we, what we are seeing is uh, a fast forward effect of the current situation in 
energy transition and digitalization of the industry. Um, we all, it, it seems like there is a common understanding and there is kind of a, um, we, we have become more conscious of the uh, necessity of really uh, thriving towards, uh, um, uh, towards uh, climate change uh, initiatives and decarbonization and so on. So we really need to uh, push forward in these and um, uh, seems now that we are now working more, uh, working harder into this purpose. So this means taking into account sustainability, taking into account climate change, taking into account energy transition and decarbonization. And in order to be able to, this, to do this, digitalization is a must as well. So uh, these are the kind of things we are working on as a group, yes, not talking about the startups, but talking about the strategy. There are two major uh, forces that are driving us. One is uh, energy transition in terms and decarbonization in terms of uh, production of energy. We are growing at a rate of about uh, four gigawatts per year in terms of new renewable energy. We already have an installed capacity of 46 um, gigawatts of renewable installed capacity around the world that is kind of uh, half uh, of the installed capacity that we have. Mm -hmm. And this means bringing lots of technology, lots of digitalization into the construction of these new plants. We cannot use the same methods we were using before to build uh, what we mostly do, that is wind and, um, and solar photovoltaic. We need new methods. We are building a solar photovoltaic plants of a few hectares of uh, dimension. So it means new methods, it means um, new ways to control the construction plants. It means new ways uh, of working together to be able to do that. That yeah. in terms of energy transition and decarbonization, uh, what comes to production. And then we have decarbonization in terms of the uses of electricity. And that's the other main I think we lost it's you. It's a company that we set up. Um, oh, it's yeah. maybe a problem with the communication. Yeah, Do you hear I'll, me now? I'll just move to one of the other guests just while it gets better. Rob, okay, we okay. give you a chance to just introduce yourself. So, so I apologize for that. Sorry. Ah, yeah, no problem. My name is Robert Nivert. I'm from 500 Startups. We do seed investing. We have about 3,000 companies in portfolio. We do energy in almost anything else. We have about over a dozen funds throughout the world. So we're very broad. We're not specific to this. Uh, and we tend to invest very early, oftentimes before revenue. Yeah. And let, let me ask you then. So so Fernando was just talking there about the, the big organization in terms of NL mm -hmm. and the, mm -hmm. the acceleration that's taken place. What are you seeing on the ground if you're doing seed? Yeah. And what's yeah. What have done to in terms of the... Uh, transition in terms of looking for seed because some people say that the market mm -hmm. dried up a little bit for seed yes in energy yeah so for us it's actually really interesting i'm going to give two interesting facts one's called an inversion there are more a rounds than seed rounds a large number of vcs are reinvesting in their existing portfolio to ensure it can survive covid and all the downturns that are happening so you see a large number of a rounds that are at about the same valuation so they're basically re-upping to ensure they can survive what that mm -hmm. means, though, is if you haven't raised funds already from an existing VC, it is extremely difficult. The numbers are actually substantially more negative, meaning the probability of closing around if you do not have one are actually quite a bit lower. So basically, they're doubling down on their ones they have. They're not actually taking a lot of new investments. Most of our forecasts are for this to ease up uh, the beginnings of next year. There was a change in regulation that's now going to allow new investors into VC funds starting in October. I don't know if you know, but the U.S. actually changed a regulatory that allows a large number of uh, retirement funds and other things like that to come into VC funds. We expect that to take about three to four months before that kicks in. You'll see a large number of funds starting in January. But in the short term, it's actually quite difficult if you haven't already raised funds. Okay, great. Temple, what, what would be your view? Because uh, you're at the uh, smaller end of the market in clean technologies, as I understand it. What, what are you seeing in terms of the result of kind of COVID and the impact in terms of investing? Well, we are, we're actually closing two completely new deals right now, as well as closing three financing for our existing portfolio companies. Um, we're trying to be 
um, not not exploitative. And in fact, I wouldn't say that we have been in any way exploitative for the fact that, <laughs> that Rob was saying that you know there, there is very little capital out there that's flowing. Yeah. Um, that being said, we are finding that you know we are offering what we would consider in any situation fair terms, um, and uh, the 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 sort of the entrepreneurs and founders and their legal counsel seem to be uh, more accommodating, let's say, than they have been in the past. So um, that's challenging. But we've also it's it's been hard to sit down with these entrepreneurs and say, guys, you know, this revenue growth that you're actually proposing that your valuation is 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 indexed to is going to be a lot slower and a lot lower than you anticipate and that and just walking them through the logic and it it affects everything from not just the sales and the fact that your sales team can't be out, out there actually making sales if there are direct if that their their sales dynamic is a direct relationship but also just the pure development cycle we're seeing a lot of delays in procurement particularly if any, any kind of components that are needing to be outsourced. Um, and that dramatically impacts revenue growth as well. So mm -hmm. we're, we're seeing it really kind of across the board, but we're still very active. You know, what's uncomfortable in my, you know, 25, 30 years of investing, I've never not broken bread with the CEO of somebody of a company I've invested in. And this is the first time we're going to be investing in two CEOs that we haven't had the opportunity to meet. Yeah, different times. And so you're in the US as well. G give us your best story about what's happened in terms of COVID and what it's meant in terms of investing in terms of a, a particular example, if you can, I'm not necessarily mentioning names, but actually sure. about how you've made deals happen. Sure. And I, I agree very much with Temple. We're seeing for for a whole different set of reasons, which is another <laughs> another panel, maybe. There was this big swell of clean tech 2.0 or climate tech funds being raised at the end of 2019, very beginning of 2020. So there are a dozen or more well-capitalized energy specific early stage investors. And a lot of generalists are now seeing so much climate change in the headlines that they're realizing that 2006, seven's failures do not doom the industry forever. So the, the capital is there. The challenge is that startups are struggling to meet those metrics that investors look for, as Temple was saying. If COVID is shutting down your conferences and your customer meetings and the procurement processes of your target partners, it's harder to meet those ARR metrics or, or win those customer logos that catalyze the fundraise round. So if, if businesses have had momentum going into COVID and are able to show some continuity, and that's been much easier in, in wind and solar than in oil and gas, if we're talking energy, that has been an advantage. Uh, and then in terms of closing deals digitally and remotely, I think many of us are in the same boat. We, we closed two new investments during peak COVID in, in March and early April. Those were both relationships that we had before the lockdown set in, but we're also very seriously advancing a number of deals that would be entirely digital. In that case, it's important that the founders have experience in the industry, which means they should have a network where we can reference them personally. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you, thank you. Let's let's hop back uh, into Europe and Costas. Maybe you could kind of uh, give us a picture about what you're seeing. We've heard a couple of uh, examples there about deals being done completely on a digital basis, where not necessarily kind of uh, meeting people and putting things together. What 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 are you seeing from a European perspective? Yeah, not much. Not things are not much different in Europe. Uh -huh. uh, again, as Brooks said, we're close to, to close a deal uh, related to an energy company. The only thing that I, that I want to, to underline here regarding energy startups is because we're speaking of really smart people which have uh, come uh, along with ideas that are brilliant and because energy is the future, they think that uh, they think very high of their valuation of their companies. So it's very hard to sit down, as Temple said, and really agree on specific terms that is realistic and can be uh, put forward. Um, we have, uh, I have met numerous people in, that, in the space, brilliant, with, uh, allow me to say, and capacity to commercialize their ideas. Uh, so it's uh, up to us as uh, investors to become trustful partners, build a relationship and really forge uh, you know, a partnership that will uh, nurture growth mm -hmm. uh, all in, in every area. And for example, 
last uh, in the last webinar, I, uh, Elena was hosting uh, people that were speaking about artificial intelligence. In the, in the previous one, about uh, software, whatever. In now that it is energy, and when we talk about game-changing industries, you can you have to expect smart people which do not have a clue of how to commercialize their innovation and uh, need assistance in doing that. And uh, we are putting a lot of effort rolling up our sleeves to do so. But we're optimistic that uh, out there, brilliant ideas are ready to be invested. Yeah, great, thank you. Frank, you, you were talking about actually you're in the process still of raising, raising capital, specifically for uh, deployment in energy and across energy systems. Could you give us a flavor about how that's going and, and which areas you're hoping to invest in in the future? Definitely. Uh, but let me also connect with, uh, with Costas sure. uh, because we're, we're uh, specializing in uh, helping startups in, in these early stages to find their uh, path to growth. Yeah, very uh, important. Co-investing with the likes of you um, in, in the later stages. So I, th I think there's room for collaboration there. Um, then uh, indeed we're in, in uh, well-progressed stages of fundraising. Actually, I'm proud to say that we've been able to uh, get a cornerstone investor being a pension fund uh, to uh, invest in early stage startups, so pre-seed startups, which, which, is a, which is a very, well, uh, uncomfortable zone for them uh, to be in. Um, and the way we've been able to do that is, is create momentum already uh, early on. Uh, so we, we started this process uh, last year. Uh, so we had built that trust already over a longer period of time with this pension fund, but also bringing along some of the private capital. So family office wealth and uh, form, informal investors that also bring in a similar chunk of money into the fund, mm -hmm. uh, grouping uh, that money in, in quite a unique uh, setup of very structured pension fund money, which is eager to invest in the early stages as to get access to later stage investment. So it's starting a train of investment uh, along a path and bringing that together with the entrepreneurial spirited uh, VCs and private wealth parties uh, that do see uh, that the energy system is changing and there's an opportunity for them to jump in now uh, to, to become part of the, of the new reality of, of a energy transition. So just a, just a question on that. So you managed to sustain that interest, the initial interest from uh, institutional investors, pension funds through COVID in order to kind of seal that and bring that money in for, for a pre-seed uh, type investments, yeah? Yes, um, but obviously in general, um, it's what has been described. Many investors are, have just been, well, scratching their heads and taking care of, of the existing portfolios mm -hmm. and, and very reluctant to go into something new. So everything which, which has been happening over the last couple of months with us, also our portfolio companies, already was started way before that. And we, wow hardly any new movement yet it's it's be, it's now emerging slowly uh but it's been very yeah dead in water for a while yeah thank you uh, maybe i could go to mark actually if you wouldn't mind actually obviously representing centrica and a, and a, a one of the big organizations in this and your role in terms of innovation and scouting as i understand it um what, what's COVID done to that kind of process of you looking in the market to try and find those innovative businesses and maybe bring them into, into uh, your wider business in terms of Centrica as, as part of that energy transition? Is that, has that been yeah. accelerated, halted? Tell us a little bit about what, what's been going on with, uh, with Centrica. Sure. So being an energy supplier, um, what COVID had impacted basically was a, um, a huge um, a drop in demand. Uh, about 20 to 25 percent of the demand coming from commercial and industrial clients so you have yeah. less revenues and then you also have an increase in net debt uh sorry in bad debt from from customers simply stopping to pay and obviously you need to continue you need to continue supplying them energy and gas as uh, it's, it's an ethical and, uh, and legal requirement so um so the fact that you that you have a corporate that starts shaking um on top of you creates creates a lot of noise or a lot of um uh, as 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 we were saying, a lot of uncertainty about about what they can be focusing on now. So we've seen we've seen a transition of the corporation very focused on the short term, 
um, I'm trying to understand what it all means for for the future of the of the company, of our clients, of of of, of our footprint, and then and then having let's say I would say less um, attention span for for uh, for innovation. But at the same time, as we as we as we were coming out of the, at least the first wave of COVID. We then see the corporate understanding the value that that innovation has once you're able to kind of like uh, you know, stop feel like you're not drowning and then be able to look ahead, being yeah. able to look four or five years in the road. So yeah. I think from them it's been most about there are two things that 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 they really care about in the, in growth uh, f- and and we are the channel to market and one of them is immobility and the other one is is home energy management. So we're trying to help present companies in, in in this particular space which the corporate has already at least accelerated the acceptance that this is something they need to be doing and 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 that's a positive effect for for us yeah so if i was just to summarize maybe what you were just saying there i mean that, that effectively there's a kind of a covid has been there's been the initial kind of respond to the situation which is kind of obviously uh, a ma- major major crisis and there's a second phase, which seems to be coming now, which is about the rebuild, which is basically one of the new opportunities. Where do we need to be? And at the moment, you're in the, in in the transition to that situation. Is, it, is that a fair reflection of where? Yeah, where you're doing yeah, that? I think you've put it more eloquently than me. Yes, it is. <laughs> it, it is that. Yeah, thank you, um, Alex Alexander. What, what what would you like to add about in terms of how quickly this kind of we're, we're switching from this respond to let's say this kind of you know we use this phrase build back better has come become very very kind of um, uh, much used but what what do you think Alexander in terms of actually how how quickly that transition is happening now and and maybe unplugging the capital to let it flow into new opportunities I think you're still on mute Alexander oh sorry sorry uh, no thank you. Uh, we are focused on energy transition startups, and uh, from uh, my point of view, uh, pretty all of uh, our portfolio companies uh, feel better than before crisis uh, because uh, they predict a lot of uh, new clients and already signed a lot of new clients for energy transition technologies such as IT for energy, for example. Uh, also, a few of our companies uh, received, uh, for example, future, uh, future fund money, government, uh, governmental support. Uh, but it's no key uh, matters, uh, key factors for uh, surviving and for future development. From uh, our point of view, uh, crisis has an impact for efficiency of the startups uh, much uh, better than uh, it was before. Uh, mostly companies who have a big uh, part of products in uh, software uh, have uh, significant uh, benefits uh, from uh, remote work and uh, from uh, lockdowns also. For us it was a bit strange, but we are happy to see it. Yeah, great. Thank you. And, and Thomas, what, what would you add to this? What about the transition taking place and when, when, when are we going to do capital and block? and free more free do you think yeah for sure so a lot of interesting things have been mentioned um so uh, so first thing i want to say is we are i think it's a great time for um climate change energy tech e-mobility focused startups companies and funds i think everyone's seen amazon's uh new climate change focus fund two billion released a couple of days ago I think Chris Saka, one of the legendary VC investors, uh, just launched lower carbon capital next to the lower case capital, a super successful fund. And, you know, there's been a new fundraise, I think last week in Europe, call, uh, a fund called Pale Blue Dot raised about 60 to 100 million, totally climate change focused fund. So uh, so it's a resurgence. Someone mentioned from the panelists, <clears throat> CleanTech 1.0, that just destroyed a lot of money it was, you know, investing in their high capex, very, very time uh, intensive startups, nothing worked out. All the investors lost tons of money. Sort of everyone shied away from the space for a decade plus. I think we're seeing a second resurgence. I think uh, there's many more startups focusing on software. So not so capex intensive with, you know, uh, lower sales, sales cycles actually. And actually seeing some of the exits, you know, we've seen Zonin last, last year, we've seen, you know, uh, tons of, 
tons of exits in the mobility. You know, we just had a, actually had, was on a panel uh, just two hours ago with BMW I Ventures folks. You know, they had two exits in, in a month. You know, one is Mapillary, which sold to Facebook and also a huge one billion exit to of MoveIt, Israeli-based uh, company to Intel. So, you know, a lot of space there. We, we So we were very happy to be in this space. Uh, mm -hmm. It you know, very bullish on this space and excited. About what Alex mentioned that, you know, uh, all the impact was positive and stuff. We, I am quite bearish on COVID. I think we're going to see a lot of third and second and third degree effects. I think we haven't seen the worst, you know, it's starting from the public markets, which are way overvalued, stupid in my opinion. And, you know, the worst is to come. Uh, and it's a lot of indications on that. You know, when retail investors and Robinhood app go and, you know, make money, then you're in trouble. Um, and from, you know, from the other, other side, you know, some of our companies did well, the ones, you know, operating in the, you know, last mile food space in the delivery space. Sure. It was great. You know, I have to be honest, some of the companies lost some of the very important contracts. They've been delayed, you know, cities cut the budget, corporates cut the budget. So, you know, I, I think on the balance, it, it definitely impacted every single company and the balance kind of balanced out to be okay for us. You know, if I was a, star, a, a VC fund working on, you know, travel uh, companies, tourism companies, retailers say I'll be, you know, it'll be a shit show for me, but uh, we quite like it to be in this space. So, so it's okay. But I think worst is to come in my opinion. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe we hope you're wrong, but uh, I can see why yeah. you, would, you would think that. Let me put it to the panel now then in terms of, you know, we, we kind of seen that there, that there's enough uh, capital there, as you said, Thomas, about basically the recent raises that you mentioned about, Amazon created a new $2 billion bound fund about breakthrough ventures. So, uh, and, and so there's lots of examples of plenty of capital here. It's its deployment. And I suppose my question to the panel here would be, in which areas do we see this? So is it gonna be in renewables? Is it gonna be in things like battery technology, uh, energy efficiency? Uh, is it gonna be in other areas like kind of new uh, nuclear? Uh, so wh where do we think that we're gonna see uh, capital most deployed, where we're going to get the uh, best returns, uh, the most opportunity. Does anybody want to kind of have a have a view on that in terms of which parts of the energy uh, kind of uh, system we're going to see uh, most uh, investment? Fernando? I can. Sorry. I can very quickly just just a few thoughts. Uh, I think EV charging space uh, together with electric vehicles is uh, super hot. There's a okay. lot of investment from from the utilities, corporates, and a lot of M&A activity, which brings more capital, so more startups because they've seen success. Uh, yep. We're very focused on the mobility markets in general. I think you know with the prol proliferation of electric bikes. E-scooters, new modes of transport, especially post-pandemic, and a lot of cities investing billions of dollars into new, you know, bike lanes and controlling that infrastructure is, you know, going to require a lot of uh, investment and success. And we've seen tons of exits like Mapillary or Move It lately. So again, that's mm -hmm. very hot topic for us. Right. So mobility and and EVs are something that you think. And any other thoughts about which are going to be the hot sectors about where capital is going to flow well, into? And I, I will not talk in terms of uh, where capital is going to be allocated, but where needs are coming from. So for sure, renewables, yeah. that's a must. For sure, electrification in terms of uh, value-added products and uh, services for end customers. And end customers means uh, B2C, B2B, and B2G, in which governments, municipalities, yeah. cities play major role. Mm -hmm. So anything that is related to this, plus the digitalization of all assets and all the operations, that's a must. For the industry. So in a nutshell, these are the, 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 the needs where the, this innovation needs to, uh, to go. I'd okay. like to add that uh, um, uh, the flexibility and um, um, yeah, the, 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 man, the logistics of energy uh, are changing rapidly. Uh, mm -hmm. In my mind, the, the key area for uh, looking for the right investments is in that domain, which is completely digitally enabled, of course, uh, because it's totally information driven, um, but managing uh, demand and, and, and supply uh, and, and storage uh, and, and, and making our grids capable of dealing with that. Also an exchange between electricity systems and, well, molecule or thermal uh, systems 
uh, that need to get connected and are working together more. That's where we see the most uh, potential. Yeah, yeah. So the kind of interfaces between those different things, between the grid, batteries, and different things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What What about in the uh, U.S.? Maybe Ernst, maybe you could give us a view about which of these sectors do you think are going to become hottest as we go through this transition? Sure. I, I echo a lot of the earlier comments. The the most Promising investment prospects are maybe in enterprise software where there are known playbooks and more capital light strategies. But we've also seen, uh, excuse me, we've also seen a, a return to the uh, attraction of hard tech investing in recent months. So there's this new wave of, in particular, green hydrogen, seasonal storage, maybe next generation nuclear and geothermal. And mm -hmm. that does require, in, in my personal view, larger funds and longer timelines. So things like the, the Amazon fund, uh, different EU pools of capital, breakthrough energy ventures, and several others are and private equity firms going down, I guess, upstream into earlier stage, are funding the kind of deals that since 2006 or seven, nobody was willing to touch with a pole. And mm -hmm. hopefully that's because the fundamental science has improved and the cost curve has come down. So I think you see this bifurcation of Software, classic Silicon Valley, uh, SaaS, cloud type investment, and then also a return to more science and materials based investment. Yeah, yeah. And, and do, you, do you see that being basically kind of like the question is really not really the capital that's available, it's just kind of coming out of COVID and then basically the risk appetite is there now that technology is much better, Vince? That's a good question. I think it's probably more the latter. It's the coincidence of, of the cost curve and the technology arriving while there's also this pent up frustration and desire to solve bigger problems, which is probably enhanced by COVID, just seeing the systems level problems that, uh, that we have as a society and that big ideas and big programs might be needed to address them and, and start addressing them early. So whether those end up being good financial investments yet, I don't know, <laughs> but yeah. it's great to see them going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good answer, Rob. What what was you, what you think that, that obviously the smaller scale? Yeah. Um, what, 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 I think areas do you think are going to be focused on in terms of that energy mm. system? So, so I definitely think uh, I'm, I'm I'm sort of only qualified to make a comment on a small part of that. We've been yeah. working a lot in mobility, and we're seeing a shift in a lot of it. To people are now much more conscientious about contact and how they move and how they get from place to place. Mm. So from mass transit systems support for now we're down to sort of micro systems where a lot more bikes and scooters because of the shift in people's attitude and how they choose to commute and how cities are making those changes. And some of the speakers actually just made reference to that. Several of the speakers before me made reference to that. Our, as a society, COVID is causing us to make certain shifts towards spike, to more open and outside eating. And what we're seeing now in mobility is that a shift to investment in things that facilitate this new reality that you probably don't want to stand in a tightly packed bus with 70 other people. Mm -hmm. And it might be like that for a long time. Yeah. So we're seeing a shift to this more of micro mobility. Bikes are hard to buy. I don't mean to say anything, but bike stores in the San Francisco area, a lot of them are sold out. That's not something that's been common in the past. Yeah. So what we've been looking at and where we're choosing and where we're seeing the shift for us, and it's only a very small part of of what some of the other speakers have seen, but specifically we've been working with mobility companies, is a shift to this micro mobility, is a shift to a scooter versus a bus. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think there may be one thing that the, the funds have, have missed that they maybe is in the past around energy in particular is that basically a change in behavior, like humanizing energy, if you want to call it that, is basically now actually kind of coming through and in, in, impacting on investment decisions. I mean, just- I agree, I agree. I agree. And uh, we were, and I'm going to agree, in the past, clean energy has been so a non-starter issue for a lot of investors. And I've also noticed that the memory has fallen away. Almost no one I speak to actually remembers what happened 10 years ago, which yeah. I think is, it's kind of weird, but a good thing, right? I mean, I'm old, so I remember it, but <laughs> lots of others don't. So, but it, it gets people to be more hopeful in their investments, yeah. um, hopefully yeah. not as foolish, but, and I'm gonna agree with the other speakers, they're in more lower cap investments, but that bifurcation that he talked about, we're also seeing that. We're not at the high end. We're not in the large cap stuff, we're only in the small, but we're yeah. definitely seeing that bifurcation with yeah. a lot more small software investments, agreed. Yeah, yeah. so let, let, let me ask uh, somebody younger, Costas, you can yeah. give us 
Yeah, I just wanted to add. I just wanted to add. Because you are young Yeah, I just wanted to add on that that uh, yeah. from us as as, a, as an investor, it's, all, it's also very important to take into consideration the government stance on the on the matter. And it's true that whatever we said here, it's accurate. And of course, the ne the future is uh, clean energy and renewables. And we we see particularly in Europe there are a lot of initiatives uh, throughout the European Union and uh, specific regulations that provide motivation to investors to pull capital to, to this kind of uh, investment, which is very important for, for us and facilitates our play. Uh, so, and uh, it's very crucial because in such sensitive industries, if you are not aware of the regulation, you can really destroy your IRR and your, uh, and your investment. Remember the clean tech disaster 10 years ago. So uh, I remember the Lime the, scooters in San Francisco, <laughs> yes, which also yes. had that problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's very important. Uh, whatever we said here is, is totally correct. I totally agree with everyone. It's so, I just want to underline it's very important for, as an investor to check out the regulation and the government's policy in, in industries specifically such as uh, energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. What Good incentives point. they um, say, taxation, uh, incentives for uh, investors, et cetera, everything, FDIs, et cetera, everything. So let, let me just pick up on that point, actually, Costas, in terms of actually one of the things that COVID has obviously brought about is basically massive government spending that we've never seen before. And obviously, particularly in Europe, where there's a 750 billion euro fund, which is basically to try and kickstart the uh, economies in Europe, has been very much said that it's going to be green investments that are going to do that. I just wondered if we can get some views on the panel, which is basically that, A, do they see that that actually, that investment made by government will go into green kind of uh, projects? And if it does go into green projects, will that help kind of uh, reduce kind of risk and therefore improve kind of basically investors' appetite to kind of get on the back of some of this stuff? So will basically government kind of funding really kind of act as a catalyst to, to kind of uh, make it easier to invest? And any, any views on that? Mark, would you, would you take a view from, from a centric kind of point of view on um, or no, just I, I view and, uh... No, I, I don't really have a view on this. Um, okay. And uh, I'm Spanish and, and the regulation in Spain did a lot of damage for, for, for clean tech when suddenly it just overruled the incentives that they had put at one point. So I'm initially wary of, of government incentives, but um, so, but, but I'm not qualified. I haven't, I haven't read enough about this, um, okay. uh, about this new support. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can I try? Yeah. Um, I think um, the general sense is that uh, recovering from the current crisis and, and preempting the, the, the next one uh, involves a lot of green technology and, and to a large degree, a lot of technology is there and a lot of capital is there to make it work. Um, governments are seeing this and play a role, but they can easily get in the way by trying to re regulate it uh, too much and to structure it or to wave from one or move from one way to the other. So um, I think we need to understand the, the underlying uh, mechanisms, uh, uh, which are also cultural. I think people um, uh, also de democratically demand more resilience in our supply systems. And that's, uh, that is a, a deeper sentiment that will drive uh, change in behavior, change in uh, consumer uh, attitude, also in change in investment, uh, which, which will also influence uh, governments, uh, I'm, I'm sure. Um, and and there, there are a lot, a lot of pieces in, of the puzzle also um, regulatory wise uh, in place or in development that can really enable that uh, transition to accelerate uh, much faster than we envisaged. Yeah. So we've, we've got about five minutes, a bit more, maybe just around five minutes left. So let's start, just uh, uh, have some kind of closing um, views from the panel uh, on what next. I mean, Freak's kind of, you know, in a sense, kind of open that up a little bit in terms of talking about uh, the um, uh, change in consumer attitudes, change in government attitudes uh, that we're seeing. So what comes next in terms of energy investment? What, what do people think about, will this be something over the next kind of uh, 6, 12, 18 months that we see 
uh, a lot of capital flowing into kind of energy systems, uh, partly to due to the kind of resilience that's, that's required, that I think people demand, but also the kind of climate issues. What comes next? So um, who would like to talk, uh, talk uh, and give the views on what happens next, Rob? I was gonna say, I have maybe a very small point. Where there's money, it's going to get spent. We just saw, and a bunch of the other speakers mentioned, there's a bunch of new funds. They've now taken the burden. They have to spend that money in some ways because they have to get the return. So I'm gonna say, actually, the success of those funds is an easy way for me to forecast success of those investments. Basically, I know coming down the pipe, those funds are going to be spending for various reasons. So I, in my opinion, I see a significant rise. Uh, against the backdrop of what some of the other speakers mentioned, it's going to be tough though. The evaluation process, the agreement with the founders, that same valuation problem mentioned by the other speakers. But overall, I expect actually a shift to increasing spending over the next few years, just because the money is there. The funds have funding. Yeah. Um, and, the, and that's gonna generate the investments. Okay. Anybody, anybody take a different view for what Rob just said there, basically that the money is there and it will get spent. It might be tough, but it. But I think that's his sentiment is that, uh, you know, the capital will get deployed. Thomas, what's what's your view? Yeah, I, I like to add a few things. So, so you know, there's, there's, a, there's a big macro view. I think a few, few things to sort of look at is, uh, in my opinion, Tesla, to look at what else they do. I think they just gained, finally got approval for utility license in the UK. So, it's not like they just revolutionized the electric cars and the yeah. batteries, but also will do a lot of other things, including virtual power plants and so on. So I think they are a very interesting thing to look at. I think, you know, we should track what, how Nikola Motors uh, goes on and, and helps with, uh, you know, hydrogen fuel cell semi trucks, or it's just more of a sort of Ponzi scheme. Uh, also, I think 8th of July, uh, there's a big announcement uh, on, from one of the European bodies, maybe European Commission on hydrogen. So it's going to be a huge new strategy on hydrogen with a, a lot of money being um, being spent on that space over the next 10 years or so. So we are super bullish on this. We have one investment in Israel on, on the technology. So I think this is someone to track. Yeah. yeah. Great. Just one, uh, just one addition, guys. I would like to use my right as a host. Can you please add two seconds uh, uh, in your speech? Like one habit that you gained during COVID that you will uh, use that you didn't have before. And second, what has changed in your investment process due to COVID, which you will also not change? For example, virtual data room, like really quickly applicable. So one personal and one business thing, Elena. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'm happy with that. Um, the habit I picked up is sleeping eight hours a day, uh, and I, and I, to the extent possible, I'll try to keep that up. Um, okay, I'm jealous. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess I have a long commute, so it's help. It's helping. I don't have to commute. Um, and the uh, the one thing maybe we picked up is about the. Um, well, I, I think just COVID showed how much how many of the meetings and how many of, of our of our face-to-face um, uh, -face sometimes communication is, is, is not as necessary or it's not as critical for taking for taking robust decisions particularly in the, in, in the investment uh, sometimes video call will do and and, uh, and and documentation and reviewing documentation the technology is there for, for it to do it effectively so um, I look forward to keeping that up Could you invest in company you never met? Yeah, yeah, um, I, I wouldn't have a problem with that. Yeah, but I will obviously you just triple check. I mean, you know, you, che you check with companies how you check with clients, check with you. you anyways, due diligence will 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 show um, any potential anomaly. I think uh, mo most mostly people in big cities uh, have a very important habit for our subject. Uh, you know, 21 days, uh, people need to create a new uh, habits. And uh, now people have a habit to see a, a clear sky. In London, in Amsterdam, in Moscow, in Berlin, uh, everywhere. And uh, I believe uh, it will have a big influence for uh, policy in the nearest future. 
I I just gonna add. Yeah, I love what Alec just said. Yeah, I, I think it's a it's it's a huge thing. I think folks have seen the clear skies, and you know they they loved it, and it's something that's gonna stay. Hopefully, stays a habit in their heads. Uh, another thing, professional. I think we're gonna do as a fund. We we didn't used to have so many sort of deal flow calls uh, with other funds, which we're doing now. Very sort of, as we sit at home, we do it so often, and I think we're gonna try to keep that as, as a habit. Can I uh, connect to that? We, we uh, as Rockstart have decided to become a remote first company. So we're closing our office. Um, and uh, we're, we've experimented during COVID with uh, all the, the, the interventions that we do with early stage uh, startups and founders uh, and investors. And, and we found ways to create engagement and learning effects uh, with uh, using online tools. Uh, so that's gonna be a big shift. And my personal habit, which I took up, is reading books, like real books, you know, back again and going offline uh, rather than being online on the screen all the time. So that's something I want to keep up. Uh -huh. Right. Costas? Yeah, on the personal habit side, I would say uh, I became more disciplined when it comes to discussions like that, because you can understand if everyone speaks on the same time as in real time meetings, and when the connection is bad or you have laggings in, in audio, it can create a, a chaos. So we have learned, I think, to become more disciplined when uh, participating in virtual meetings. And on the business side, uh, we have learned to always be prepared for a disaster scenario and to have a plan B in, in place. Because uh, as they say, hope is not a strategy. You have to really strive for the best, but have a plan B in place ready to be activated in case in case things go bad so and and we 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 ask that from for our from our portfolio companies actually every time we ask for a budget revision we also ask for a plan b based on specific parameters that will uh, get worse so fernando are you having eight hours sleep uh no not really but what i'm doing is uh, i'm uh, Taking advantage of the committed time, I'm not uh, doing it right now to do some exercise. So that's the habit, habit I now I have now, you know, doing exercise on a daily basis. I hope to continue doing that when I need to go back to commuting. <laughs> so I'll see how to manage that. And um, from the business perspective, uh, perspective what we have realized is that uh, there were some face-to-face uh, -face meetings we used to have with, the, with startups before engaging with them. And now we are moving completely virtual. So uh, we've been able to continue doing the scouting, to continue doing the meeting, and to continue starting the projects with the startups. Uh, more than 40 uh, projects that we have launched already this year. So um, I think it is something we're going to continue doing. We are going to uh, uh, doing these virtual meetings, uh, much less traveling, much less uh, expenditure, not only for us, but also for the startups. So I think we'll continue that trend. Yeah, great, great. I'd add, yeah, a lot of biking, but maybe a hybrid work personal one, trying to be much more thoughtful and deliberate about physically uh, making stationary work healthier. So whether it's ergonomic keyboard and mouse, kind of the, the blue light protection glasses, comfortable headphones, back support in the seat, with how much time all of us spend just sitting at a desk and, and not even getting around to commute and travel, it, it's just important to take care of yourself and your team physically, uh, even if the work is all feeling digital. Yeah, great. Well, I think we're just about out of time, Elena, but I just want to thank everybody. I think it's been an absolutely fantastic discussion today uh, and uh, really, really appreciate everybody's time and their views and being very candid about where things are at the present time. I just got one final thing today, which is when we have a Zoom call, you always got to give the award to the best bookcase behind the person. I think, Fernando, you probably just get it this time. So many congratulations. Elena, I'll pass it back to you. Chris, yes, and I want to hear your habit as well. <laughs> well, I try and do, I try and kind of chair more Zoom calls. That's what my personal thing is. Now, um, <laughs> I think I would say, like Fernando, I've tried to do a lot more exercise since uh, lockdown, and uh, and uh, and also read quite a lot. In terms of uh, uh, professional stuff, I think that it's just shown that basically how much you can do 
uh, in terms of actually digital. And uh, that's not going to go away because all those times when you're kind of chasing around between airports and things like that, it's not a great use of time. So uh, this has been a great use of time today. And uh, thank you, Elena, for, for, for facilitating and setting up. So thanks, everybody. Thank you.